Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part two of our workshop. I think I can very well say good afternoon, good day, and good evening, because we are participants from all around the world. And uh, my name is Nicole Franceschini, and I'm going to be the moderator of this session. I'm an emerging professional currently working as a lecturer and a researcher at the Chair of Heritage Management of the Technical University of Brandenburg, Germany. Before we begin with today's session, I would like to share with you some information about this session and about the two sessions that are actually coming to an end today. Um, this session is organized by the members of the Emerging Professional Working Group of the International Council of Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS, IUCN, and the International Center for the Study and the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, ICROM, and the Chair of Heritage Management of the Technical University of Brandenburg. Today for this session, we have three guest speakers. We have Marike Franklin, we have Maya Ishizawa and Clemens Cooper, and you will get to meet them very soon. But before we start, I would like to actually share a few words with you and also set a little bit some rules of the house. As I said before, this is part two of a two-part workshop that aims at engaging with young and emerging professionals in discussing the challenges and opportunities in nature culture integration. At the same time, this workshop also aims at better understanding the perspective of young and emerging professionals by bringing together professional, researchers, community leaders from both the natural and the cultural sectors. For this session, we've established very few house rules. We kindly ask you to keep your microphone muted during presentation to avoid any disturbance or disruption to the session. And we have a couple of ground rules for, to foster amicable and positive discussion. If you want to intervene, ask a question or share a reflection, we kindly ask you to either use the raise hand button available in your reaction tab or to write down your name in the chat box. We kindly ask you to keep your microphone muted until you're given the floor by one of the moderators. In this session, we will hear from Marike Franklin and Maya Ishizawa about opportunities for engagement and about inspiring experiences of bringing nature culture concerns and dialogues within existing networks of professionals, researchers, people, and communities. Additionally, Clemens Cooper will explain how to engage with IUCN on the topic of nature culture interlinkages. Marike, Maya, and Clemens will offer an appetizer of the work we will be doing in today during the workshop. We will come together to discuss current and future opportunities and challenges. We will look at strengthening the network of interested organizations and professionals by addressing the needs and opportunities created by young and emerging professionals in this ongoing nature cultures dialogue. The workshop will also be offered in Spanish and we kindly ask those of you interested in taking part in the breakout room in Spanish to please message Lenica and you can actually message her um, live by using your message box and then during the breakout room we will make sure to actually um, place you within one of the Spanish speaking rooms. I will stop this presentation to actually um, already move on and introduce to you our first speaker. As I said we really want this session to be interactive so We've done everything possible to keep presentation short, but to actually offer you presentation of inspiring activities and inspiring initiatives that have taken place and that have been guided by um, inspiring professionals. And one of the inspiring professionals we're very lucky to have with us is Marike Franklin. And I kindly ask Marike to turn her camera on and get ready with the presentation. Marike Franklin is a landscape architect. She completed her master's degree in landscape architecture in 2015 at the University of Pretoria with a dissertation titled Wuppertal, the preservation of absence, which explored the challenges associated with the development and conservation of the historic town of Wuppertal. She joined the team of Cape Winelands Professional Practices in Association in January 2017, where she assisted in the compilation of a heritage inventory for the Stellenbosch municipality. Marike is a member of ICOMOS, where she's serving as the ICOMOS IFLA Scientific Committee for Cultural Landscape, ISCCL, as a bureau member. Marike was the dialogue convener uh, for the Nature Cultures Dialogue Series that ran as part of the Nature Cultures Integration Working Group within the ISCCL and currently hold the position in the group as a co-convener. 
Thank you very much, Marika, for being with us. And we're looking forward to hear more about the Nature Cultures Dialogue series of the ISCCL Working Group on Nature Culture Integration. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you for the for the kind introduction. And I'll uh, jump right right into the uh, into the presentation. So, um, um, as uh, Nicole mentioned, I just want to place the dialogue series within the ICOMOS uh, framework and. Um, it uh, sits within the ICMOS uh, IFLA joint group that focuses on cultural landscapes. Uh, and within that group, uh, within the working group on nature cultures integration. And, um, and then uh, it's quite important to understand what the, what the nature cultures um, integration group stands for within, within this working group. And it's, um, it, uh, one of the first objectives is to, to work towards the recognition of um, and engagement with globally diverse human um, environmental worldviews and cosmologies. And that's pretty much looking at the entangled dimension of, of culture and nature. And um, yeah, so as, as a solid base uh, for the group. And then the second objective is to actively engage with ICMOS, ICN and ICROM in their work to integrate nature cultures in all fields of heritage conservation and management. And it's just to say that um, even though we within ICOMOS, within a specific uh, group and within a specific working group, we're also um, actively looking outwards towards um, our sister organization, if we can call it that. So the dialogue series, um, in the uh, uh, was a set of talks that we hosted within the uh, over a running year, and at that time the conveners were Steve Brown, the Pooh Prati, and Fran Han, um, and I was responsible to to convene the dialogue. So, so that's just to um, yeah um, state that up front, and it will um, uh, I'll focus in this uh, presentation slightly more on the technical aspect of of getting it up uh, up and running. And to take a step back, um, it was, um, it went back to a well-organized annual meeting in um, Dublin in October, 2019. And although the Nature Cultures Group has existed uh, for quite some time before, that's when I actually got um, introduced to, to the group. And it was, um, the annual meeting was an incredibly well-organized meeting um, specifically within the ICCL. And it was um, hosted by the, um, Ireland's National Committee. And the way they structured the site visits and the field um, uh, visits uh, uh, in, uh, in connection with the symposium was really well done. So you really got to meet a lot of um, individuals. And as part of being such a small group, um, the cultural landscapes working um, for the ICCL group is about, has about 200 members. So it's actually quite, quite small and therefore there's a lot of informal talks and, and or scope for informality, which is always uh, quite, quite nice to, to work with. So in, within the symposium, we had a random breakaway group um, and I was at that time more interested in the rural landscapes working group, but that was only scheduled for the next day. And it was sort of a 20 minute, it was almost like breakaway room. So we were huddled in the one corner of the, um, of the meeting room and, um, we had this little discussion and at that time I didn't even know what what nature cultures integration meant because <laughs> um, we um, I thought we, we worked with it every day it's always entangled and it, I was I was quite unaware of, uh, of, of the bulk of information behind it so um, and then we, we had really dynamic and dedicated individuals within that group so from the onset it was uh, supposed to be this um, they wanted to work, they didn't want to be another group, and, um, and we had excellent co-conveners uh, to, to steer the direction and to facilitate some of the, the energy that came out of it. So there was a need to, um, to meet once a month, and then by the end of this little huddle group, I said, oh, well, uh, why don't you meet online? Is that not something that you do? And, uh, and Steve said, oh, well, maybe you want to look into that. <laughs> no. And by the time I got to the, to the little technical part, and this is uh, quite technical, um, I realized that it's not that easy to organize um, a single meeting uh, 
across the world because all, all of the members in that group were scattered all over the world. And uh, so the, the one thing that came up was the time zones were, were really <laughs> difficult to overcome. And then the second thing I realized was, ah, oh, it was towards the end of the group. And I'm not even sure if everybody would be interested in, in doing this. And, and it's important to mention this was pre-COVID. So it was sort of free online working groups and things like that. So um, I, I decided to uh, set up a survey monkey just to confirm interest and to confirm willingness to participate. And if so, when would they like to meet? And, and actually in that survey monkey, that was incredible because um, I got this, uh, the first six presenters volunteered um, from, from the nine individuals that filled out the form. I, I could establish the 1 p.m. and 10 p.m. GMT times as being the two times that would work well to meet. And um, based on that info, we decided to um, start organizing these meetings uh, every second month. Uh, so one month would be 1 p.m. GMT time and the next one would be 10 p.m. And that way, every um, uh, yes, um, the individual sort of indicated that they'll have scope to, to meet every second month. So that was, that was quite interesting. And then um, before every dialogue, um, session, which was a 60 minute um, dialogue session. We circulated the reading by each presenter and then we had the individual uh, presenter um, taking up 20 minutes of the time and then having the discussion afterwards. Um, which worked well quite for, for six months. So we had a uh, organized planning meeting just to see if everybody was happy with it, if they saw the value in it, and everybody was quite keen to continue. So we, we embarked on another survey monkey um, to plan the next set of dialogues. And, uh, and with that, um, we, um, a, another set of uh, individuals volunteered. And with a planning uh, meeting that we hosted afterwards, that set of collaboration between the individuals was quite important and um, after that we realized that um, and and it's important to note that Maya joined us at um, dialogue number four which was her presentation and she really helped to um, to keep dialogues really informal and and the discussions quite clear and um, so Maya sent a message oh, why, why can't we have the read uh, pre-circulated presentations or pre-circulated questions or something like that and I thought oh that's that's quite a difficult one to manage and then with all these funny information coming together we uh, we started doing a, a new format and it was sort of um, pre-circulated presentations of 10 minutes each we were able to host more than one presentation or circulate one more presentation before and then dedicate the entire 60 minutes to a panel discussion which it, it was incredible um, a step up from from the previous version so that was uh, that was quite great and that we ended the dialogue series with on a high note that was a year and then we embarked on the new uh, work plan and that's where we are at the moment so I'll, I'll talk a bit about that later so just in terms of the benefits that came out of this was the continuous dialogue between members was was great I mean uh, just the con continuous um, effort the continuous meeting um, and it was also important to, to note that we actually started really small. So five, um, six, six members consistently, and it, it was just a great, great informal discussion. And then the second benefit would be um, the formal and informal connections that formed during these dialogue sessions. So we, um, other people linked up to doing work together. Um, I gained a really good friend, Maya, you can see a, a little email or WhatsApp chat, um, um, going on and and it's quite beautiful and then the third one was to collaborate to collaborate with presenters across ecomas ecrom um, bringing their expertise to the table and also within the working group itself there were a few um, um, volunteers coming up with oh i'll do the booklet for the dialogues i'll look into the dialogues the the, the elements that we missed so that yeah the i'm really really um keen on collaboration. I think it's such a such a good thing that allows us to be more than ourselves. And I'm, I'm sure any one of you work in a, a dynamic group that pulls in the same direction yeah, can testify to the same. The other benefits that we got from this was um, we uh, managed to build up quite a 
large repository of work um, related to the nature culture's journey. And we got to cram in all the reading before every session. And uh, this is just a, um, a, scheme, a screen clip of one of the um, presentations that we, uh, that was the reading before, before we um, had the presentation. And every, every presenter um, were all members of the working group and they all bring their own um, view to the nature culture's journey. So uh, Jeroen was specifically a geographer and he brought that to the table. And, and so everyone um, brought their own um, knowledge and, and that was great, quite great. And then the added work that we got related to the, to the nature culture journey was the, uh, the recorded presentation. Uh, that actually added to the benefit. So on, on top of the existing um, information, we actually got to, to add even more um, in, in terms of uh, pre-circulate presentations. We have that whole repository and also to the dialogue sessions that was that active and dynamic, normal language um, discussion about nature cultures and, and the journey that we, we're on. Um, so in terms of the work plan, uh, this is where we are now. So uh, the last meeting was all the orange uh, bits added. So it's, it's quite in progress, but we try to uh, work on a, a plan that's measurable, um, realistic, achievable, um, doing less than doing more. But we, we actually have a set of individuals that's really eager uh, to, um, to participate. And it's, uh, it's great. I mean, any, any set of volunteer work to add to this, um, yeah, is absolutely welcome. So, um, and then the, the little bit of the last uh, work plan that we're engaging with, and we're still finalizing all of it, um, ended up um, with the engagement with IEC and ECOMAS, MOU, work with other IECs, the engagement with ECOM, webinars, another um, an event for, the, for our GA 2023, um, theory and management practice planning to, to write that up. Um, and then to continue to do case study. So that's where we are at the moment. That's all still really fuzzy, but we, we broke into smaller groups um, uh, who's uh, pulling up work plans and, and we'll see where all of this uh, leads within, within the next year, um, within the next two or three years. So yeah, really excited to see, see what comes out of that. Uh, that's it. <laughs> I think that's my time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marike, and actually thank you for sharing this experience that is not only very interesting, but also very inspiring. And I think within also the reality of, of ICOMOS, this is really one of the good practices of actual engagement of members. So thank you very much to, to share with us this experience, but also we hope that this is an experience also of inspiration because similar things can be done into many different networks. And so I think I'm actually confident there's going to be a couple of questions coming for you, but we will continue to Maya's presentation. So then we can actually group all the questions into a discussion frame. And I ask Maya to get ready. Um, Maya, she's always an architect and a heritage specialist. She holds a degree in architecture from the Universidad Ricardo Palma in Lima, Peru. And after earning a master of media and governance at Keiko University in Japan, she went on to complete a PhD in heritage studies at BTU Cottbus Senftenberg in Germany. Her doctoral research focused on the conservation of cultural landscapes. Between 2015 and 2020, she coordinated the activities of the UNESCO Chair on Nature Culture Linkages in Heritage Conservation as a visiting lecturer at the University of Tsukuba in Japan. And she was engaged in the training of cultural and natural heritage practitioners in Asia and the Pacific, where she also looked at developing a comprehensive approach to heritage conservation. Currently, Maya is a consultant involved in various heritage and world heritage related projects, and she's one of the coordinator of the ICROM IUCN ICOMOS Panorama Nature Cultural Thematic Community. And I'm actually very, very happy to see Maya here presenting to everyone um, the work of the Panorama Nature Culture Thematic Community and how to engage with it. So Maya, you have the floor and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Nicole. Can you hear me? Is my mic on? Yes? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry, because I cannot see. <laughs> thank you, Nicole. Actually, I'm going to present a work that I have been working with Nicole. <laughs> we have worked together on this uh, implementation of the Panorama Nature Culture Thematic Community. Sorry, I 
move my thing. So I will introduce you to this uh, project that it's um, uh, embedded in the World Heritage Leadership Program of ICROM and IUCN. And this is uh, a community hosted uh, by IUCN, ICROM and ICOMOS. And it aims to bring together heritage practitioners from the natural and cultural heritage fields to share their management challenges and strategies to learn from each other, generating a community of practice and heritage network at global level, cross-sectoral and multidisciplinary, which goes beyond world heritage. So Panorama Nature Culture addresses some key issues found at policy, research and practice in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention and in the wider heritage field. The World Heritage Convention is a unique international legal instrument that brings together concerns about natural and cultural heritage. However, it defines cultural and natural heritage separately in its articles one and two. In the implementation of the convention, the World Heritage System, uh, sorry, Yes, the World Heritage System and national administrations have followed a nature culture divide, which does not necessarily exist at local level. Local communities and indigenous peoples hold diversities of worldviews where nature as a separated entity is not a norm. This has brought misunderstandings and issues in the application of the World Heritage Convention and heritage practice in places where other than the naturalist ontology are fostered. Hence, policy needs to adapt to local realities and be built with bottom-up collaboration, and there is a need to collect evidence. In terms of research and practice, the divide is reflected in the disciplinary and sectorial backgrounds of professionals working in heritage conservation. In order to understand heritage in a more holistic manner, interdisciplinary research and cross-sectoral exchange are necessary. So Panorama Nature Culture addresses these issues by documenting nature culture practices happening on the ground in order to provide evidence for policy making towards interconnecting natural and cultural heritage sectors and embed heritage in the larger sustainable development framework. But what is Panorama? So Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet is a partnership initiative by, led by ICN and GIZ involving 10 organizations. It connects the fields of conservation, development, and international cooperation in promoting sustainable development through work and experiences on the ground uh, with set seven thematic communities. Panorama online platform documents and promotes examples of inspiring replicable solutions across a range of conservation and sustainable development topics, enabling cross-sectoral learning and inspiration. Panorama allows practitioners to share and reflect on their experiences, increase recognition for successful work, and to learn with their peers how similar challenges have been addressed around the world. Following the Panorama solutioning approach, case studies are documented as solutions using a standard format that identifies replicable building blocks, which are the key success factors and the context in which the solutions were implemented. Solutions are shared on the online platform and through publications. They are also integrated into capacity development activities and workshops. This methodology for learning and innovation is applicable across topics, sectors, and audiences supporting the upscaling of successful interventions. There are two main users, which are the solution provider that documents and uploads his work, which is then reviewed by experts and peers convened by the portal hosting organizations, and the solution seeker that accesses the solution and adapts it to its own context. Solution seekers can contact solution providers and exchange further information on their case studies. In this way, a knowledge, a knowledge exchange network is generated based on peer learning. So within Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet, Nature Culture is a portal that brings you to a universe of case studies dealing with the intersections between natural and cultural diversity and their role in sustainable development. Nature Culture Solutions illustrate place-based and people-centered approaches to heritage practice and link the protection of cultural and natural values in heritage places. Nature Culture presents case studies from indigenous peoples, territories, rural and coastal landscapes, seascapes and urban landscapes in connection to communities and their cultural practices, highlighting the importance of integrated heritage protection and management. 
So to start the nature culture thematic community, the World Heritage Leadership Program has curated 20 pilot case studies of heritage places inscribed on the World Heritage List. And these showcase examples of processes that involve landscape approaches to heritage management and practices that interconnect nature, culture, and people. These cases are published and can be already consulted. Yet the portal is not only dedicated to World Heritage properties, but it is expected that it will be populated by examples of all types of sites and not necessarily internationally recognized. The portal is also co-hosting solutions from other panorama thematic communities, and at the moment around 300 solutions can be accessed through the Nature Culture Portal. So how to navigate the Nature Culture thematic community? A practitioner that is facing certain challenges in the management of their heritage place and who is interested in looking for inspiration and ideas that he or she could apply in their context is called Solution Seeker. Solution Seeker can enter the nature culture thematic community through the nature culture portal at the web uh, link that I'm showing there in the, in the image in the slide. So once one enters, one can look to all solutions or can customize the search by entering the filters that enable classifications by region, if one is interested in looking for case studies in a specific geographical area, by ecosystems to select examples that are more relevant to one's own environment, by themes that are very varied and include local communities or sectors, or by challenges which are divided into climate, ecological, economic, and social. So all these filters can be combined and make your search more targeted. Now I would like to take you to one nature culture solution to understand how these are presented and accessed. So for instance, this is one of our pay, uh, pilot case studies that is valuing interlinkages between nature and culture in the planning and management of Pima a key World Heritage Site in Canada. This case deals with building alliances among a diversity of right holders and stakeholders, including First Nations and provincial governments, in order to safeguard the cultural legacy of the Anishinaabe indigenous people and their particular relationship to land. <clears throat> the structure of the case study is composed of a summary where the solution is br briefly explained with a general background of the heritage place. A series of classifications are provided, which give the context. We can locate ourselves through a map and learn about the challenges that the solution is addressing as well as the beneficiaries from its implementation. Then the key components uh, called building blocks can be accessed independently. This shows specific alliances developed, management practices or participatory mechanisms used for addressing environmental, social and economic challenges by using nature culture people approaches. So how building blocks relate to each other is fundamental to understand the process of implementation of the solution. A testimony from a beneficiary or an implementer illustrates the experience on the ground and the impacts on the community. The solution seeker can then have a complete picture from diverse perspectives. Then we can find a gallery of pictures. The main contributor is called the solution provider and represents the main implementing organization in charge of the solution. If a solution seeker wants to know more, he or she can request for relevant information by contacting directly the solution provider by email. Resources such as website links and document links management can be accessed here. As well, the organization involved in the solution are found in this last section and can be linked up to their websites where solution seekers can find more information on their work. So when one clicks in a building block, there is more content display. In this case, the building block is the creation of a multi-level and multi-stakeholder partnership that was the basis for the solution, as it brought together right holders and stakeholders to work on building a common ground and defining common objectives for the conservation of their heritage place. So classifications are specified such as alliance and partnership development and co-management building, as well as the enabling factors and lessons learned, which are the more important aspect of a building block. These are key for understanding the conditions in which the solution has been implemented and the longer process that these are connected to. This is important information to consider for a potential adaptation in a different context. Each building block has also a gallery of pictures 
and access to other resources, which sometimes can include links to articles and other documents relevant to a specific building block content and implementation process. From the side of solution providers, you can join the nature culture thematic community by sharing your experience. At the heart of the thematic community are site managers, site management teams, institutions, and communities sharing their experiences and the work they do to effectively manage heritage places all around the world. <clears throat> to guide you in the reporting of your nature culture solution, we have the 20 pilot case studies in all regions, diverse contexts, and showcasing all types of heritage places, including natural, cultural, mixed, and cultural landscapes. You can find a list and the links to this pilot case by entering the learning sites page at the web, uh, ECROM website. So after registering on the Panorama platform, one can begin uh, with submitting case studies which in the context of Panorama are called solutions. Only registered users can author a solution. Solutions can be either full solutions, which consist of a full account of your experience or snapshot solutions, which, are, which only offer a chance to give a short overview of your work. So full solutions are broad overviews of a case study. These solutions are made of the seven components that I explained you previously when looking at a solution, which includes providing basic information, including the title, the location, a summary of the solution and its impacts, and an overview of all the organizations and possible co-authors involved. Each solution <clears throat> is hosted within a thematic community and solutions can be featured in multiple thematic communities, especially when they showcase relevant experience for more than one. Solutions are about learning from others, so it is important to offer enough context and information for, for others to understand your site and the challenges your solution is addressing, as well as identify the beneficiaries. Besides the more technical description, solutions can be further illustrated through inspiring a uh, and personal story of the solution in action. Then come the building blocks that are the backbone of so full solutions and building blocks exist in combination with one another. So it is key to describe how they interact with each other to form a solution to address the specific challenges. So after completing the format, the solution can be submitted for a review. A second shorter option is a snapshot solution. This is a short overview of a solution which only includes a summary and the relevant tag categories needed to contextualize it. Additionally, a solution provider's manual is available in the website. So if you are interested in joining the Panorama Nature Culture thematic community, or if you need any advice or support with a solution, contact us at the naturecultureparanorama.ecrom.com Org. And please join us and share your experience with colleagues worldwide. Thank you and be in touch. Thank you very much, Maya. And thank you for actually showcasing um, the work that has been done on the Panorama Nature Cultural Thematic Community and, um, and for showcasing actually how people can engage with this platform. And I think this is really the important part because you can engage with Panorama, both in looking for solution, inspiring solution approaches and projects that have been done all around the world. But of course, as emerging and young professional, you also have your own experiences and experiences that can be of inspiration to others. So if you are interested in joining Panorama, there are a couple of links that you can find in the chat box and you can also get in touch with us because of course we want to hear about um, different experiences. I will kindly ask Clemens to join us and um, Clemens will actually give you a quick introduction on how to engage with IUCN, particularly for those interested in the um, bridging the nature culture divide. Clemens joined IUCN in 2020 as evaluation and operation officer for the World Heritage Program. He is responsible for coordinating the technical evaluation of sites nominated to the World Heritage List as part of IUCN's role as an advisory body on natural world heritage. Clemens coordinates IUCN uh, upstream support, which provides directly to state party before the preparation or submission of a nomination. Before IUCN, Clemens worked at the UNESCO World Heritage Center in Paris, where he monitored the state of conservation of natural and mixed world heritage sites 
in the Europe and North American region in close cooperation with IUCN. He studied geography in Bonn, London, and Edinburgh, which sparked his interest in concepts that are bridging nature and culture. Clemens, you have the floor, and thank you for being with us. Yes, thank you very much, Nicole, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good night, everybody. Uh, it's nice to meet you all. Um, I, I will be very brief uh, so that we can uh, quickly uh, go into the breakout rooms for the interactive uh, session. Um, so be, before the workshop and also shortly before the uh, Global Youth Summit in general, we were thinking about uh, the situation we're in now, normally uh, this would have been part of an in-person, in presentia meeting in Marseille last year. Uh, now, due to COVID, we have to do everything online. So um, what is missing with online events is that opportunity to have a coffee break afterwards to exchange business cards. Um, at the same time, online event enables us to have much many more uh, participants uh, joining these workshops. So it's also an opportunity. So, so we're wondering how could we uh, try to um, somehow still have a, in a way, a networking effect um, of, of this event, even though uh, uh, that it's online. And um, so uh, if you've also joined uh, the first session on uh, uh, Wednesday, you've also seen uh, Tim's presentation on the IUCN Nature Culture Initiative. So uh, we are really ramping up efforts within IUCN now to um, promote uh, integrative uh, perspectives combining uh, nature and culture. Um, so if you're interested or if you have anything on that, please feel free to reach out uh, to, to us. Uh, I'll be posting my email address here. Um, if you're interested in uh, keeping in touch, having a loose network, feel free to just drop me a line, uh, not even a long message, just an empty message is also enough uh, to stay in touch and to stay informed uh, of what IUCN and the Nature and Culture Initiative uh, will be doing. Um, then, uh, whenever you need it, you can use me as a contact point into IUCN. Uh, feel free to contact uh, us or myself. And then secondly, you might have seen in the chat that Nicole has uh, posted again a form uh, to sign up uh, if you like to stay connected uh, to uh, the ICOMOS Emerging Professionals. Um, so with these two measures, uh, we try to uh, sort of keep the network of, of uh, these two sessions uh, to, to combine ICOMOS, IUCN, youth, and uh, that are all around, evolving around nature and culture and integrating uh, these perspectives. And uh, perhaps just as a last point, um, for, forgive me that I'm also advertising for another event that's uh, taking place on Monday. In case you're uh, interested in uh, um, youth engagement in IUCN, uh, there will be a big review report being presented and the session seeks to see how that could be turned into action. Uh, including a survey uh, where you can participate to um, help shaping potential future action uh, by IUCN. So I'll be posting that Google link to the event uh, in the chat uh, as well. Great, thank you very much. That's it from my side. Lovely, lovely. Thank you, Clemens, actually. You've been very, very brief <laughs> to maximize time for um, what we're actually about to do. And I will just very quickly share my screen with all of you. So as you can see, we are in fact moving towards the more dynamic part of the workshop. And after you heard us speaking far too much probably in the past um, session and also in this session, we really want to have more engagement and to actually bring the conversation on what are we not doing in the sense that you've seen things that are happening and what is happening in different projects. But it's also important to know, especially how to better engage with young and emerging professional and with 
do think across all sectors that intergenerational partnerships are particularly important, but also to better understand, you know, how are young and emerging professionals already engaging on this topic? So we are going now into breakout rooms and every breakout rooms will have one moderator and two rapporteurs. So once you get back into your room, um, that's gonna be once again, you know, a little bit um, organizing and all of you will actually have the chance once again to listen to anything that was said in the past two days, if you might have missed something. But what we want to do is actually to make sure that we are discussing few key points and I will get to the few key points that we would like to discuss. I would kindly ask everyone to remember that this is a professional respected and harassment free workshop. So make sure that you use a respectful language. This is something very important. And please follow the rules established by the moderators in each room. This is important because we just don't want everyone to talk on top of each other. So either use the raise your hand button as I explained at the beginning or write your name in the chat and wait for the moderators to actually um, give you the word. What we want to do is to bring the attention to five main themes that look at networking, engagement, education and capacity building, but those are conceptual discussion on nature culture, whether we are all living nature culture and the divide in a similar way, whether we're experiencing it in different ways, but also to better understand that nature culture divide between education and practice that many of you actually have asked and sent question after the first workshop we had on Wednesday. Um, my colleague Shari is currently dividing everyone into breakout rooms. Please remember if you want to be in a breakout room in Spanish, just take one second and write us in chat so we can actually make sure that we um, we don't, you're not feeling left out, that we actually is an environment where you feel comfortable engaging and working. Um, if not, everyone is going to be mixed up into different groups. Every group will discuss these five themes and you will get more information from your moderators. And the important part is that we want to hear back from you. And of course, we want to hear what you, which group is actually doing what was said and what was reported. The important element here is that um, we also have the two rapporteurs that are going to be noting down all your comments. So if the conversation is intensive and you want to say more, use the chat. We're going to save all the chat boxes so that we can always follow up on comments. But um, just let us know, you know, if there is any trouble or if you're experiencing any issue with the breakout room, you can't hear us, reach out to one of the moderators and they will actually take care of making sure that everyone can participate. We will reconvene in um, about half an hour time to actually hear back from all the different breakout room. We are very excited. We're very much looking forward to hear what all of you have to say. So please participate and, you know, have actually bring out all your perspectives, opinion, the way you experience the nature culture divide or not experience the nature culture divide. And we see you back in half an hour, have a lovely conversation with one another. And um, I'm looking at Shari to see if she's ready to go with the breakout room. Lovely, then see you in half an hour and have a great conversation, everyone. All right. Amru says tech volunteer. I guess he doesn't need to be assigned. Yes, indeed. Okay, great. Um, fantastic. Uh, just a couple of other people who aren't assigned here um, who are joining in. I could just add them in randomly. Yes, do that. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't have an option here for, I think the others just have to um, give the yes. acceptance to join a room. So Perfect. just waiting that for them. Great. I think I'm breaking. I'm I'm bringing back actually uh, Marika and Maya here in this room. Oh, okay, cool. Yes. I put them in group five, but then it's easier. Yeah, don't worry, don't group. worry. 
Yeah, cool. All right, then I will jump into room four, if that's all good. Lovely, yep. thank you, Shari. No worries. <laughs> Do they leave Maya alone now? <laughs> I thought they left you alone, Maya. Thank you, Shari. This is really cool. <laughs> like, what's up? Hi. Hey. Let me just check with um, Chelsea. Because we couldn't place her in a room. No? But um, I, I thought, uh, Nicole, that you would ask uh, questions, but not. No, they have, a, they have a list, actually, of questions that we have shared. So they have five different questions. I can show you what it is also. Do we have to ask uh, to reply to questions or not? Um, we're doing the discussion with you after the questions. Because the problem we had last time uh... is that we went a little longer with the discussion. And then nobody had the time to ask questions, which was, we had to really hash up to get a couple of questions at the beginning because nobody was talking. Once we opened the door, everyone wanted to ask questions. And, um, and I had to move Clemens to this session because he, could, he didn't manage to talk during the previous session because there was too many questions coming in. So the hope. I was a bit confused by uh, Clement's uh, talk because uh, what are the activities of Nature Culture Initiative? Is it a panorama actually? <laughs> Isn't it us already? <laughs> I think, I don't think it's a very defined, I don't know because I talked, so I talked talk to him and I talked to Tim, so I don't know. But Tim, 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 what did he present on, mon on Monday? No? Tuesday, no? Wait, no. I need Wednesday. to check one thing. Give me one second, because oh, I need to check. I need to check what is being live. Maya, Marika, let me know if you want me to move you to any of the rooms. <laughs> Hello. No, it's fine. I'm profiting to just do something else. <laughs> That's good. Me too. But you are you are recording anyway. No? Yeah. I'm also okay no. here for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So we have about 20 more minutes in breakout rooms. So yeah, I will send out a message later when things. Accidentally click the, the option to go back to the and main room. Yeah, because I think I was still talking to the participants of my breakout room. <laughs> yes. Do you, I mean, do you want me to send you back? But everyone is coming here anyway. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, maybe I'll just wait. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. I think I was saying that everyone was a little, was intensively chatting, so I didn't want to, to break out anyone. Oh, so Stephanie's here. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Hi, sorry. I click the right. button yeah me too i know well joanna is also back so i'm glad to see you all <laughs> i see everyone slightly slowly coming back to the main room <laughs> so, i will perfect
Lovely. I think we're all back in the main room, as I'm seeing right now. The all the other room actually empty. So very successful. I hope you had a nurturing and positive exchange. I was actually piking into everyone's comments and notes through the Google Drive. And it seems that there was a lot of very interesting conversations going on. And I really hope it was a favorable moment for exchange. Um, I would kindly ask that we take actually around 15 minutes to get back, actually 20 minutes in total, to ask all groups to get back to the plenary. So to actually give us a five minutes feedback of what was the main point of discussion. It would be important that the either moderator or the person reporting back also makes it clear which of the five points were actually discussed by the working group so that we know what was the context of the um, discussion. I don't want to put anyone um, or to actually force anyone to go first, but if there's one group that feels they are ready to go, please, <laughs> you know, raise your hand or open your mic and um, and take the word. So make me I can choose. Tell you about room two if you want. Lovely. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we started out like deciding which topics we wanted to do, and we decided on education and capacity building and engagement. Um, so when we started out, we kind of had like the thought that uh, somebody said that education is not really teaching enough yet about cultures, like when just school education. Um, and then Camila was talking about how from an architectural standpoint, there is currently not a lot of connection that's made like when you're learning about architecture but there is some like there is some opportunities to learn about like cultural landscapes and that's kind of becoming more common but it's not talked about as much as it maybe should be and so there's kind of something that's lacking there but that it will be become more common of a discussion as like cultural landscapes are now becoming world heritage sites and so on um and she also posed a, a question about um, like how, sorry, let me find the right spot in the notes, um, about like how we can balance what we preserve because if we're preserving the land around a monument, like to preserve it, then how much can, of that can we preserve before it just becomes like we're protecting everything? So uh, yeah, that was a common, a question that she posed to us. And at first we didn't really have much thoughts, but we kind of talked about um, how the landscape can be connected also to the building of monuments. And so we had the example of, uh, Camila brought the example of the Palladio architecture and um, um, urban landscape that had been connected to the agriculture, like the, the monument had been developed that in, with a connection to the agriculture. Um, and then Clemens brought up the cathedral that had, had, was near his house where the landscape was changed because of the way that they drew the materials from the land. And okay, and we also had an example, um, Nivedita with the Taj Mahal area and how it was being polluted. Um, and the area around it was really being polluted. And so they brought a lawsuit in order to make it, uh, make the industries that were polluting the area move out of the area and it was successful. Um, so we think like we were basically talking about how studying these cases more closely and more often would be really valuable because we feel like it's not quite happening in education that you maybe study so many cases like this. And so if these cases are brought more into education, that would be good. Um, and then for engagement, ah, sorry, I did something weird in the Google Doc. I'm so sorry. One second. All right, yeah, so then we um, started talking about engagement um, and how people can get involved in this and how Clemens was uh, talking, we're talking about sustainability and how can people, be can younger people be considered in this conversation about sustainability? How can we get them talking about it? 
Um, and then we were talking about the connection of engagement to education, which we think that through things like training camps, youth groups, um, and so on, the young generation needs to get the knowledge this way. Um, and Stephanie was talking about that and that we need to learn from each other and that there's still this link between in education, which we were talking before and this engagement. So the more people are having these learning opportunities and being engaged, the more, uh, the better it is. And then um, Prasad was talking about his experience about balancing SDGs with other things and how do we progress from here? And he said that it's really important that we come together at all levels, um, communities, governments, et cetera, and it's all a circle that's connected. And so we think that the path forward is through connection and not confront confrontation and not um, battling each other about what's the most important, but working together and that everyone has answers and examples so that we just need to figure out what those are from each other and how we can best move forward. Um, and then Graham was making the point that education just can be a great tool to conservation and preservation and what do we value is key to everything and what is the public value? So that was what we talked about. <laughs> Thanks, sorry. Fantastic. That was a lot of food for thought already in one group that we can bring back to discussion but I think there were very important elements that you brought up that are also very much connected to what we heard in session one which is really the balancing preservation protection with actually the wider sustainable development discourse as well you know and how do we make sure that preservation doesn't kill everything else and the vibrancy that society also needs and I think a very important discussion and I think to a large extent you are the most important voices in this conversation because you are the one who's going to make a difference and I think this is very important that what was be said also in engagement and the need to create new opportunities it's very much needed and I think there is the moment where we can think on how to work together within our networks to strengthen these opportunities and it's something that I think we're going to come back right before we close into how do we actually maximize the networks we have already within this room. Thank you, Jen, but also thanks to everyone who was in this group. Well done. Um, who's next on the on the list? Who's willing to go next? I think I'll go if it's okay. Yes, Metali. Thank you. So ours was a um, breakout room four. And it was a great mix of people, I would say, because uh, we did have people who have just started working on site on the field. And we had people who are currently enrolled in masters or are somehow related to heritage. And uh, I think this, this is the reason why we discussed mostly about networking at both why you are studying and after you've graduated. And also to see nature culture divide in general, what is the understanding? Uh, it was uh, great to actually understand the entire perspective from um, a person who's studying because uh, we had in the room people who are not actually aware about such networks and for them it's the first time that they are getting acquainted to it and all the initiatives which are being uh, taken care of. However, uh, we also had a discussion about the initiatives which are currently being taken by the organizations and how effective they are. So uh, for example, some of the people in the room are already involved in most of these and uh, some are actually mentoring in some of the programs. Uh, for, for example, ICOMOS International Scientific Committees and stuff like that. Uh, while the people who are actually working or are connected to the site managers, they feel that there exists a gap. So this gap uh, is definitely uh, connected to academics, but at the same time, there was a comment where um, one of the persons in the room felt that something like Panorama could be a great tool, but maybe that tool is not accessible to people who are there on the site or the community members who are actually involved in the site. So maybe this is an opportunity to look forward and when something where we can approach a wider audience who's directly connected to the site. Uh, also, there was a discussion about uh, whether we should pinpoint one organization in particular to take care of nature or one organization for culture. And one of the questions was that if we are aware about community involvement in a natural uh, nature culture 
site, uh, how can IUCN contribute towards taking care of it? Uh, which was uh, actually dealt with a lot of views, one of which was that we should not pinpoint towards one organization because it's a lot of collaborative work and we have to take care that a lot of these organizations uh, take volunteers while they are on the site. So, uh, which further led us to understand how can we involve volunteers, especially people who are studying world heritage or people who are involved somehow, architects, heritage practitioners. Uh, from this, we went to organizations which can actually collaborate with international organizations or national organizations. For example, uh, student organizations or volunteer projects, which can then be involved with such professional uh, organizations like IOC and NECROM to uh, participate in on-site uh, working. And uh, I think more or less this was it and our conversation revolved and went back to how much, what people feel about the networks themselves and do they want to contribute any further. Also about the workshop in particular, um, it seems like uh, one of the persons mentioned that Corona pandemic has done great good in terms of the uh, having such workshops because she felt that she's been attending more. And uh, these workshops have uh, bridged the gap between not being able to travel, not being able to attend such conferences, such workshops. And yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the positives that we found all through. Thank you, Metali. I, I forgot actually to ask already in the group before, but if there's other members of each group that want to say something, please, you know, take the word. We want to hear as many perspectives as possible. But I, I do think that, you know, it is a year, more than a year we live in this pandemic, but what we have already in this room is fantastic. And probably many of us would have not had the chance to really be in the summit if we had actually to travel to Marseille and to try to be in the same room. And this is possibly something that I, I, I truly believe this is something that from a generational viewpoint, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm a millennial and I'm not too old. I look too old, but I'm not too old. But I do believe that is something that we can really bring on the learnings we had because yes, Zoom tiring. Yes, we have all these opportunities, but once we go back to life out there, there is so much we can still bring on into this life online. And I think I treasure so much seeing so many people in this room and having the chance to talk to so many different people from so many different parts of the world. So I think this is something that we have to bring it on and we need to do it all together to try to continue to find the means to hold these online meetings and make sure that we bring diversity into the room. So thank you for bringing it up. And you know, we're gonna bring this recommendation also to all the institutions that you've seen in this room, especially on day one and today. So we are gonna very strongly support the aspect of continuing with the online aspect of it once we are also capable of traveling again. So I think this is a very important point. It's also great, I think, that you talked about network. As I say, we really want to hear about the networks that you find nurturing with the network that you think we should also engage with as, as professionals, something where you feel that if you have a network where you feel the nature culture dialogue can happen, this is the place where you can also connect with people where the nature culture dialogue has been established, different experiences. You heard Marika's um, experience already with the ISCCL. Within ICOMOS, they are an outstanding example of what you can do within your network to discuss things at a global level, but with people that you're familiar with and you just bring in the conversation to this point. So thank you very much for all the points you've raised. Group three, who's next? Yeah, I'm here. I'll, I'll go Thank ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, so we had our, uh, we have, we discussed several things uh, within the group, but I'd say our major focus, majorly focused topic would be uh, gaps in education and the challenges faced by the people in practice or when it comes to even an academic framework. Uh, so initially, a couple of us talked about how the existing frameworks, academic frameworks or education frameworks in their country itself are not sufficient. So which is why to learn these specific fields, it required having to move, having to move their bases and try to learn more about um, the, more about nature culture linkages in practice. Um, further than that, uh, ahead of that, I think we also spoke a little bit about how 
there is a certain sense of tokenism when it comes to youth presenting like the idea of youth presenting is a good uh, thing but the merit in their words is not adequately acknowledged by a lot of networks sometimes um i think there was a really interesting topic uh, which was once based about the kind of conflicts which are um, which might arise because of uh, because of not recognizing nature culture linkages too well uh, because you have the people who are, the local communities and people who have a certain way that they've been practicing for a long time and once and if these are not recognized or if you have different uh, authoritarian bodies which do not recognize uh, these aspects quite well then there are conflicts that arise and i think that was a really important point of discussion because we went into a whole uh, conversation about how we really need multidisciplinary people who are trying to bring a sense of balance in the whole community that is not about um, in the site and we also discussed that you don't really have tailor made i mean you don't really have one size fits all kind of solutions in this that it is really important to look at each context that arises out of each site Uh, we talked about how it's important for practitioners especially expert practitioners who may not be connected to the site to be more like facilitators uh, the importance of recognizing where we are not appropriating uh, indigenous traditional systems or knowledge especially for our own, own benefit was all the more important that it's not it's not about being i don't know a sort of savior or trying to take care of the situation it's more about making sure that there are means of support which may be provided so that systems and knowledge systems have their own uh, way of practicing and i think a lot of us had different examples to share based on where we are or based on where on on the kind of experience we've seen or the impact of um eurocentric thoughts or colonialism or structures which have had on the current governance framework of areas um and i think uh, so and in in terms of the educational gaps uh, we also raised an important point about how if you are from a certain field of knowledge then whatever education facilities that you have they keep reinforcing the same so if you have a cultural ba- background then education about natural heritage becomes more like an add on as opposed to actually teaching us about an integrated system or a holistic system or what the whole framework of ideas is in in terms of that i think that was largely it um i mean the crux of the whole conversation was basically the importance of ensuring the balance between these spaces ensuring that we are uh, we are not only mindful of traditional practices but also of our role within that and how it should not exceed a certain level um maryam meza are great note takers so if i have missed out something please let me know i'm just i'm just saying everything that they've noted down really deliberately which you'll see in the notes later as well And thank you, Devashree, for the discussion as well. Sorry. Thank you, Devashree. Someone from the group of Devashree wants to add anything, any more comments? Because you raised a lot of very important points, and especially I feel the aspect of tokenism is particularly important. And I think this is the point where I, I really wish <laughs> you make a very strong point on this, because. it is something that needs to be acknowledged that as far too often an aspect of just ticking a box when it comes to youth and emerging professionals almost considering that they don't have anything to say where there's so much that you can say and i think that the the experience that maya showed on panorama this is something we started with site managers but if you look at panorama in his own as a as an originally a nature based solution platform a lot of this solution also came from youth and emerging professional groups so there is much that younger generation and emerging generation as well as people that might not be young but they are emerging professionals within a field can bring on because you have different knowledge you have a different education and you have your own personal context and personal backgrounds that make you a, a very rich professional already and living in in the century is not a very easy thing to do so there's quite a lot of skills that have been matured in this sense before you continue i will ask claudia or anyone from the spanish speaking group to actually let us know what was what was said in the group so i will talk from the spanish group lovely <laughs> um Yes yeah, so we started talking about um education and and we saw various examples 
uh, for example, one about uh, educating for sustainability and uh, embracing a new culture in those terms of education, uh, in terms of teaching a new culture of sustainability in Western uh, European cultures in that case was. So, so the use of schools um, as a tool to teach and create those new cultures through not only the youth, but the children themselves. And to, to it also, it was related uh, how we can connect people when we are doing projects in places, because the participation of people also creates knowledge. And it is also a projection of the cultures uh, we are in and how they project to the surroundings and the environment. So when we actively, when we actively participate with other people in the community and we are hearing them out, uh, we can use that as a learning platform for them uh, to create those new cultures, to start new narratives and ensure that any heritage projects uh, has some local values. Um, also, we saw some examples on how humanship uh, modified landscapes, natural landscapes, and those became cultural landscapes. And, and then that duplicity, of course, that we already commented on being uh, natural, but also a cultural landscape. Uh, in the example of Ethiopia, uh, where some churches are caved in, in, in the rock, and it is this symbiosis of being both uh, at the same time. Um, but then we also encountered the issue of getting cultural heritage meets natural heritage, uh, basically usually a uh, verge uh, natural heritage. And then the ethical questions and protecting that cultural heritage without uh, having any conflict with the natural one. And, and the, the idea that came out from our conversation was that maybe most of the times protecting natural heritage in that sense is not just about uh, restricting it and keeping it away from people and protecting its sole function, but uh, creating new relationships, which highly relates to the culture we talk. So defined through culture, uh, what are the relationships between humans and nature and how those modify landscapes and create a whole new uh, narrative uh, between all organisms. And I'm adding here. Uh, um, then we also saw examples of uh, artistry and yeah, artistic disciplines and different disciplines being used to communicate uh, nature heritage and get people closer to it, which it's actually related to what I already said about education, about creating new cultures, about establishing those new relationships and how that has to differ from place to place based on the local culture. And I don't know if I'm leaving anything out, uh, probably yes. <laughs> Maybe someone wants to add something. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. First of all, this was really excellent. And I think I, I want to already highlight the creating new relationship as officially the sentence of the workshop, because I do think that that's really a lot of what this nature culture work that we're all trying to do is all about, is also creating your relationship or uncovering relationship that were there, but they were not empowered. So I do think that you centered the point on that. <laughs> so it's something that it was really, really fantastic to hear. That anyone from your group that wants to add anything? No, everyone too shy today? <laughs> no, but thank you very much. I think everything that you've actually reported back is, is just incredibly helpful and I do hope that you know this is going to be step one of hopefully many more chances we will have to work together and interact. I'm posting again right now on the on the chat group um, the link to actually the sign up and this is a sign up to just be in touch with the nature culture mailing list. This is a work that is in the making 
and it's for anyone who wants to receive more information on training courses, on capacity building opportunities. Um, we also hope to have a structured newsletter going out very soon where we can actually um, advertise and keep in touch, but please also make sure to, to be in touch with us in other channels. And I think the channel I flagged out was the World Heritage Leadership Facebook page because we use that channel to really post quite a lot about nature culture integration in the heritage sector. So please not only join and join the page, but contribute to the page. The page is there not only to be a one-way channel of communication, but it is a two-way channel of communication and share anything you deem to be interesting. And we're very happy to see that happen in this sense. Um, I will just try to bring back Clemens and Maya and Marike for a minute. Um, Marike, unfortunately, she has a really bad internet connection at the moment, so she might not be with us. But because I'm conscious that we're getting towards the last 10 minutes of this session, and you didn't have any chance to ask any question, if you have a question for one of our speakers, this is the moment. This is the moment where you can ask Maya everything about the Panorama Nature Culture Thematic Community, where you can ask uh, Clemens also everything <laughs> about connecting with IUCN in this sense, but um, Clemens posted this email address. If you want um, to be in touch with us and continue the conversation, write me a private message and then we will save the chat so we actually have your contact details. But if anyone has a question, please go ahead. I think Maya has a question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually I do not have a question, but because I, I heard all these very interesting comments, I just wanted to give some suggestions maybe of how to engage. I mean, now I know that uh, the situation with the pandemic is a bit difficult. I mean, in different places is different, but the best way, I guess, to engage is to look around you and find a place around you that you can connect with. And even like with talking about Panorama, um, you say some people don't have access and so on, but maybe you can be the access or, or, or the interface that can help these communities to show their cases or, or their work or the reality of, of what they are doing. So it's more like an invitation for you to take action at uh, your own places and, and, and look at your own heritage even your own communities and and yeah if 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 those could could match with nature culture panorama of course to to invite you to to submit these case studies but also for your own work and also for your own studies at the university and and so on yeah that was just um, a comment okay, i think we I think Maya is very wise in what you just said, and it's it's very it's something that is very important, and it's probably the best learning that many of us who have finished university some time ago can actually bring is really to to localize that knowledge and experience you want to do in heritage. It's something incredibly important, also to make not only to make your work important for you, but also your work relevant for you and your communities and the people around you, because it's it's heritage is very much a learning and a work in progress and so it's something that we need to do together and it's best done locally with with our communities stephanie i see you you have your hand up hi yes let me just lower hand uh hi uh, a question for maya about the uh, panorama solutions um it, correct me if i'm wrong do, do the solutions also include like um is there a room for an assessment of what didn't work in a particular case, like, do you also post failures to a bit of a tricky word, but those also are learning um, are teachable uh, experiences. So I, I, I wanted to know if you if the the data entry, if you include that section where it's like what didn't work or what challenges um, did you overcome? Thank you very much for that question, because it's actually one of the, let's say, weakness, if to say in a way of panorama, because, uh, but at the same time, it's like uh, we have been focusing so much on failure or like problems, let's say, more than failure. 
that Panorama what wants to do is to inspire people and to exchange success. So this is a principle of Panorama. So in principle, the, the, the platform is not made to share failure. You know, and also failure maybe is not uh, something complete, no? Because maybe a project or an intervention can have one aspect of failure, but also some other aspects of, of success. So what Panorama actually allows is that uh, in the exchange of the experience, you can say, you can share your lessons learned. So when you share your lessons learned, you can explain what didn't work and how you would suggest to do it better and in this way, exchange also the experience beyond the just successful or, or good practice. No? So I think there is this small space of lessons learned that can be used for that, for reflect on that. But definitely this is something that keeps coming in our discussions on Panorama is that how can we share also what didn't work to learn from that, no? But yeah, so in principle, there, there has to be some success so you can explain maybe the negative side, let's say. Thank you, yes. Yes, and I think it's really, with Panorama also, it's interesting to see because some of these case studies, they're actually known for their failures and we're actually portraying the end of the process to a large extent. So those case studies that have been long explores for failures and things that didn't work out, they come to panorama strengthening the aspect of this is how we went going through failures because failure is a big part of success if you don't fail you're not going to succeed i think that's the it's very much the reality of the work everyone does and i think it is also it's very interesting from a point of view also to see that there is a platform that finally celebrates those places that have been going extensively through trial and error and now they can be recognized for the work they have done because I think especially for those that are involved in World Heritage, we talk so often about failures that then all of a sudden you have people asking you, so if, if heritage is all about failing, why do you care? <laughs> why are you spending your time you know, studying about heritage, architecture, and you people destroying the world, and I can't build my house here and there? And, it's very important to also showcase how much these places mean for many communities, indigenous people, but also for communities that are no longer there. And I think that is also something that is particularly important is that now that we have engaged with sites that are a little bit more challenging, diaspora sites, we, we realize also how much these places mean for people that are there, but how much they mean for people that can no longer be there physically because of limitations they have. So it's, we needed to find a balance. And I think in this case, success was also something interesting to celebrate. But Stephanie, I think your point was, it, it's very important. And it would be very important also to be able to showcase a little bit more the fact that a lot of these solutions, they weren't born overnight. These are processes that in many cases took 20 years. So there are some case studies like the Dolomites in Italy, where it has been a two decades process to arrive to a point where they confidently can say the word success. But everything is always very fragile with this side. So a success today could be a failure tomorrow. And I think the important part of Panorama is that there is room for reviewing also, because it's, it's not a publication. It's something that it's published on the internet, can be revised, can changed, can be added, can be taken away. And so it's also a very interesting way, I think, to keep it up to date with what's happening within a place. And uh, that's also the reason why we, we're very interested in hearing also what, what users and people and interested people have to say about the platform to see if it's also fulfilling its role as a, as a showcasing and inspiring positive thinking. So please come back to us with more comments because we really need them in this sense. Are there any, any other question, any other comments? No. Well, in the wrapping up this session then, let me, let me do some housekeeping because it's, it's very important here. But first of all, I want to thank everyone who's in this room right now. You sharing your thought, your opinion, everything, your knowledge and experiences with us, it's possibly the greatest gift we can have in this professional environment. It's the only way we can grow. 
And it's the only way we can get better at the work we do all together. And it's the only way we can make a bigger point for heritage, both cultural and natural, being important for communities, for people, but also for our own survival on the planet, looking also at sustainable development and being in this together and having many, many big challenges to face. And I think the big elephant in the room when we talk about nature culture integration is very often climate change. So it's something that it's there, we need to tackle it. And there is much need for nature culture based solution, but also for intergenerational exchange because climate change can, we can face this challenge only together, not having parallel thinking or separate thinking. So very much, thank you for sharing all your knowledge with us. And I'm looking forward to read more about the notes and everything you share. I also want to thank um, Marike, Maya and Clemens for being here with us today, for actually being contact points for continuing this conversation, but also for showcasing interesting projects and interesting examples of how the conversation can happen within existing networks. I want also to thank the platoon of <laughs> emerging professionals, but actually very inspiring emerging professionals. I've been very lucky to work with in the organization of this session. Claudia, Lenika, Karina, Devashri, Mary, Anna, Supicha, Stephanie, Jen, Mitali, Sherry, and I hope I didn't miss anyone. If I did, please wave at me right now. But to all of you that help us get this session together, dealing with not only the technology, but actually looking at if the content that we were putting out there made any sense, really, thank you very much. There's really a lot of dedication in a group of students that meet together in a very small city called Cottbus, somewhere in the middle of Germany, but also Claudia that she's currently in Japan and it's very late for her. <laughs> so we appreciate that even more that there's a, I think it's, it's more or less almost 2 a.m. in the morning for us. <laughs> she, we we're really getting into the late time of the day, but really thank you very much and take a moment to fill in the questionnaire to please stay in touch with us. We want to create a better way to continue this conversation in a structured way. As you have heard from Tim Batman on day one, we do run culture nature journey on a regular basis. We were very unfortunate because 2020, the pandemic hit and we had to cancel not one, but two uh, journeys, which is something that we're very sad about. Well, we hope to bring it back online in some forms. So please be in touch, but not only be in touch to passively participate in it, but please be in touch to share your experiences. We want a nature culture journey done by young and emerging professionals. So for those of you who are nature people or interested, more connected to IUCN, write an email to Clemens, write an email to IUCN, reach out. For those of you who are in the cultural sector or they, have, they are trained as cultural heritage professionals, you can join uh, networks like ICOMOS. We have an emerging professional working group and we do want to hear more of emerging professionals wanting to work in this. Also keep an eye out because ICRAM is running yearly courses and we have one course coming up on people, nature, cultures. There's gonna be another course in Spanish possibly happening between the end of the year and the next year. So check out, sign up to the Facebook page. And last but not least, really thank you from the bottom of my heart. This has been a fantastic learning experience for me. And I hope to see many of you in the near future, either in person or in another online event. So please stay in touch and continue your work on nature culture and continue to share your experiences. Bye bye everyone. Thank you, Nicole, bye. Thank you, Nicole, bye bye. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank, Thank you. you. I take a minute to say thank you, Mary. Thank you, Clement. Thank you, John, for reporting back from your room. <laughs> thank you, Karina. Thanks, Thanks go to you. Oh, I, I've done nothing compared to everyone else. <laughs> <laughs>
No, no you've done a lot really in preparation and everything. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Karina. And um, I hope I mentioned everyone. I really hope that I didn't do any terrible mistakes. Supicha, I see you on Monday. So. <laughs> Supicha, poor thing, now she's never going to get rid of me. <laughs> she, she, thought, she thought going to Thailand was one way to get rid of Cottbus, but she doesn't know how far we reach. <laughs> no, but thank you, everyone. And um, well, for the Cottbus crowd, I think we will be in touch because I think we can do more with what we started here. Clemens, we also should stay in touch and yes. see, see what Tim also is cooking up on it. <laughs> Actually, I, I should also fill out the, 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 um, your link. I didn't do that yet. I will do that right now. Yes, do that. Do that. Because we're trying to use that now with um, whole nature culture, but also with, um, with the whole leadership program to kind of have more external communication also going. So that would be important. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for taking care of Hoover. I've seen your comments. It was really nice. <laughs> and thank you, Karina, for joining the, the Spanish group. Thank you, Devashri, for moderating. And yeah, have a lovely so evening, much. everyone. <laughs> have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Have a nice Bye. weekend. Bye. You. Mary, thanks for the notes. They are no super great. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no problem. I have been... Um, I have been very happy um, to actually read your, your notes and use them. So thanks a lot. <laughs> no, they really are much. amazing notes. So, sorry? No, I was just saying they really are amazing notes. There was this point when we were both So editing, detailed. There was this point when we were both <laughs> editing and I'm just struggling with the bullet points. I'm like, I'm not going to mess this up for her. She <laughs> Now I know next time who I'm going to go to when I miss the lecture. Now I know who to go to. <laughs> I know. So, I'm just so pedantic when I take notes because like I'm that person. It's just like if I don't write it down yeah. as I, soon as I hear it, it's going to go in through one ear and out the other. And it's like, oh God, I just missed something key. No, no, I'm there. I'm there for you. If you're taking notes, just send them to me. I'm good. <laughs> this might be a job for you in the future. Trust me. I've seen those when notes and I'm like, hmm, it's good to know. <laughs> Put that on your CV. <laughs> Epic fast <Okay>. note taker. <laughs> I'm an incredibly fast and detailed no. <laughs> no, nice. Guys, thank you very much. It's really, really great. You saved thank me. You. Thank <laughs> and, you so um, much. I, I will repay all of you back in recommendation letters. I think you need to ask. <laughs> Just be bold now, ask me anything. <laughs> no. And Karina, nice to meet you. I think I never I never met you in Cottbus before. So yes, yes, I know. I'm a second uh, semester student barely. So I'm not in I'm still in Mexico. I'm not in Germany yet. So <laughs> good choice. It's a very good choice. <laughs> yeah. Just to give you an understanding, it was snowing before yesterday. So <laughs> wow. It's shocking. Okay. No, <laughs> lovely. Bye, everyone. Have a yeah, good evening. Bye. Have a nice weekend, and thank you, guys. Bye. Stay bye. safe. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay safe. <laughs>